So welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed the lunch and the networking time. Uh, the topic of this session is epilepsy and school performance, challenges and strategies. And again, I'm Russ Darren, the Director of Education at Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. And we are pleased to have as our panelist uh, Anne-Marie Michon, who's a pediatric nurse practitioner with the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at Beaumont Children's uh, and a professional advisor for Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. Uh, Haley Loebline, who is a psychology intern at Children's Hospital of Michigan. Um, and I'll, I'll let you tell, your, tell a little bit more about your trajectory and where you're headed. Um, and then also Christina Davis, um, who is a family phone line representative at the Family Center for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs, and also a mother of two sons with epilepsy. And also Carrie Jo Wagner, who is an educational therapist with the Oakland Neuropsychology Center. So thank you all for joining us today and for sharing your expertise. Um, so can each of you just start by briefly describing your experience with this partic particular topic? Anne-Marie, do you want to start? Sure. Oh, thank you. I thought if I turned it on. I, I tend to talk loudly, but I thought I'll have to use the microphone. Um, so hello, everybody. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to join, and, um, and it's really nice to meet all of you. So I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. Um, I have been a pediatric nurse practitioner for about 25 years, and always in pediatric neurology and epilepsy. So um, the topic that we'll be talking about today is one that I talk about with each and every one of my families every single day. So I hope to be able to share some pearls with you and hopefully clear up any misconceptions and um, hopefully provide some, some good information and learn with the rest of the panel. Hi, thanks. I'm Haley. I am a doctoral student from the University of Texas at Austin. I'm going to be receiving my PhD in school psychology in a couple of weeks, uh, hopefully. Uh, and no, it's definitely happening. It's <laughs> 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 taken a while. Um, but, uh, so I have some experience working within the school system doing psychoeducational evaluations in Texas. But a large majority of my training has also been in pediatric neuropsychology, so I've spent the past five years or so uh, working within neuropsychology clinics and now I'm at Children's Hospital of Michigan and the majority of children that I see do have epilepsy because neuropsychology is a, a large component of their care and I will be um, moving on to a postdoctoral fellowship in pediatric neuropsychology at Children's National. So hopefully we'll be working with, continue to work with children with epilepsy. Hi, I'm Christina. Um, I actually work with Lisa over there with the Family Center for the Family Portion of Children's Special Health Care Services. Um, a lot of times if you call CSHCS, you're lucky to get me. So just know when you call, you're going to have a family member that has a child with special health care needs on that other line that truly understands what you're going through. So when you're called and you're frustrated, you need medications, you know, that's why we can help and that's why we are in the positions we're in. Um, as he said, I do have twins. They're 15 um, and they both have epilepsy. So um, September will mark our 10 year anniversary of the diagnosis. Hi, I'm Carrie Jo Wagner. So I'm the educational therapist on the panel. Um, I've been in education for, I don't wanna date myself, but it's been a while. So I started as a gen ed classroom teacher in Chicago, then moved to special ed. Um, but just as a special ed teacher, it was so hard to meet the needs of the student. So I moved to working with them one on one as an educational therapist. I've been doing that for about six years now. Um, and I really like it. Um, I mostly do executive functioning support and ADHD coaching. And I do have a six year old daughter with special needs. She does not have epilepsy, but She's adopted and has fetal alcohol syndrome, so I feel like I under I can empathize with both sides of the table, right? I've been the special ed teacher in the classroom, and I'm also the parent of a child with special needs. So that's great. So a lot of great perspectives to draw upon today. So, um, Anne Marie, can you give an overview of the many aspects of epilepsy and its treatment um, that can have an impact on school performance? So as you heard from the uh, lecture this morning, um, you know, seizures and epilepsy, um, epilepsy as we all know, it just means more than one seizure, and seizures just mean an abnormal amount of electrical activity. 
And depending on um, the type of seizure, depending on um, if it's more subtle or if it's very apparent, um, seizures definitely, in many cases, can have an impact on the educational perspective. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is that recognizing that seizures don't have to be what the general population sees as someone who has a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, like you see on TV. Because as soon as people hear, oh, you have seizures, in the general population, like when I go to do like lectures at schools or things, they automatically attribute it to someone only has like what they see on TV. But seizures can be very subtle, and sometimes we get a lot of referrals um, in our clinic at Beaumont for someone who's having staring spells or trouble focusing at school. And you know, seizures can be just as simple as a staring spell. Um, it could just be someone who has periods of confusion. Um, they can have like a loss of muscle tone. So there's many different types of seizures. But um, how we treat seizures, um, including with medications, and as you heard from the lecture this morning, there's different treatments like with diet therapy and with the vagus nerve stimulator and deep brain stimulator and all the other therapies. Um, sometimes the care that and with their seizures themselves, if they're going unrecognized, we get issues with school performance. Sometimes the medications or treatments that we are implementing also affect academic and school performance. So in our clinic, we spend a lot of time not just talking about the seizures, um, but we also talk about everything else that impacts it, like the school performance and how they're doing in school and do they have an IEP, do they have a 504, um, what can we do to help support the, the child, um, how are they doing on their medications. A lot of times um, with seizures, sometimes they're nocturnal, so only occurring at night, and then in the early morning they can't get up for school, so um, sometimes it's you know, they miss their first or second class and um, they can't get to those classes. So then we're dealing with the, with the school, what can we do to accommodate so that they can still get their credits, especially the high school students and things from that nature. So we're always looking, uh, we're always looking at what the seizures are like, where, when they're occurring, do, and what if the seizures are happening at school? Like some of our kids have seizures when they get off the playground from, um, or from after gym class. Um, do we send them home? Do we not send them home? Um, sometimes the seizures are really well controlled and sometimes if someone's having a seizure but not really having a seizure, like sometimes we have kids who have epileptic seizures but also might have some anxiety or things like that and as soon as they have a seizure they want to go home. So how, and then that affects their academics. So we spend a lot of time talking about how can we make that a safe place for the kids at school um, and so that they don't always have to come home. Sometimes they can just go rest in the nurse's office and then come back and, and rejoin whatever the day is. So we want our kids to um, be in school as much as possible because we want them to get that whole academic perspective with their learning. Because we know kids with seizures and epilepsy, um, not all of them, there are some children that are very well controlled and they don't have any academic uh, or learning issues. But if they're having a lot of seizures, or they're having, not even the seizures, but if they're having like abnormal discharges, or you heard a little bit this morning about ESES, which we see a lot of kids with, which again, if their brains are very active at night, it does affect their, their cognitive abilities and their speech uh, potentially. And so how do, we, how do we help address that? So um, those are things that we kind of look at um, as an overview. So. Right, right. So. Um, you know, just to review seizures themselves, you know, if you're having absence seizures, you, you might be missing right. bits of information throughout the day, particularly if they're not right. Exactly. And if you think about it, if someone is having a seizure and you don't necessarily recognize them having a seizure, they may, they may um, only get parts of the information or parts of the instruction. Um, they, if you, if you have someone, I like to preface like, um, especially for it's all parents, sometimes the kids look at me like, uh, you know, so we all remember what TV is like without cable. So um, let's say your power goes out and the TV goes out, or you go to turn the TV on and all you get is that shh, that really like you know like blank look on the screen. I like to tell my kids and, and uh, families, especially the newly diagnosed, that's what happens in your brain. So if you can imagine all of a sudden a burst of activity that goes off in the brain, the brain gets mixed up, or if they're not 
adequately controlled with their seizures, that's going on multiple times a day. You may or may not even know that's happening. Um, or if you have someone that is fairly well controlled, it can still happen. So what goes in, input-wise, you're sitting in the classroom, and they're not necessarily getting it. They're not necessarily hearing the full instruction. And then they're not getting the good grades. They're not getting pieces of it. Or, you know, sometimes parents will, when they come to see us in clinic, are like, they're forgetful. They're, they're, um, the teachers are saying they're, they're not paying attention. They're lazy. Can we put them on attention medicine? But when we find out that they're still having seizures, it's, it makes no sense for me to put them on something for their attention because I've got to get the seizures under control. So if you think about sometimes it's a wall that if, unless we get that abnormal discharges down, they're going to miss the, the, the information. So, and then that greatly impacts their academics. Right. So. right. And then I think another sort of hidden thing is that is postictal symptoms mm -hmm. and that, you know, some people, it may just be uh, 15 minutes of recovery time after mm -hmm. the seizure and they're right and ready to go, or after an absent seizure, they might be able to pick up exactly where they left off. Um, but in other times, um, there are some people who reported that they're not back to 100% functioning until like a week after they have right. a tonic-clonic seizure, for exactly. example. So and if you have to give them, you know, so for example, with, with postictal or after seizure, um, you know, sometimes it is, it's so fast, um, and they just might need a little redirection, like someone with absence. I might, I always say to families, uh, to, the, to the child itself, um, you know, do you ever have like lapses of time? Like, like I'm sitting there and I'm doing math, and the next thing I know, Haley's moved over to reading, and I have no idea how that happened. And it could be just like a split second to me, like I was doing this, and how did we get over here? So if you're having multiple small seizures with absence or even with focal seizures, you may miss that information. And so sometimes we have to say to, as part of accommodations, or you know, um, the teachers just have to go back and you know re-explain it. You know, sometimes. But if they have to re-explain a hundred times a day, that's what has to happen so that that child gets the information. But if you have someone that postictally falls asleep and they're asleep for two hours, and, but yet they can get back up, that's great. But if they have to get emergency medicine, sometimes they're gone for the whole day at that point. So then, how do they how do they get that information? So postictal is um, sometimes harder on the kids than the actual seizure itself. Right. Right. So um, some, some of the factors that can affect school performance, like um, you know, the underlying brain condition that's causing the epilepsy, may not, we may not be able to change that, but there are many of the factors we've discussed that are modifiable through medical interventions. So can you give a few examples, Anne-Marie, of medical interventions that you or your team have used uh, that have really made a big difference in a student's school performance? Sure, so um, you know, part of it, it Part of what we do is not only like talking about their seizures or, or talking about their medications, but also looking at everything else. So like their, like their sleep cycles. We know that if kids are not sleeping well um, or not, are not getting good amount of sleep at night, it affects their academic performance the next day, it affects their seizures. So you know we do spend a lot of time talking about um, sleep hygiene and talking about ways to help with sleep. Um, sometimes we have to use, we use natural things like melatonin or essential oils. Sometimes we have to use medications. We do not use in our practice any type of sleeping pills. But we do have to look at sometimes medications to help with sleep, which also sometimes helps with, inadvertently helps with their attention as well. So, you know, looking at things like that, if you have someone who has ESES, um, with certain medications, because um, ESES is only, you can only identify it after they've had an EEG in their sleep. You can't see it a, unless you're in deep sleep on their EEG. So we've, so we've, for many of our kids, we've been able to, with certain medications, be able to quiet that, uh, it's, the ESCS, there's a, it's called a spike wave index, which is a number. So if your spike wave index is really high, like above, say, 60%, it's very difficult during the day for that cognitive ability. So um, with the epileptologist that I work with, if we have any concern that someone is having issues with their, um, their academics, you know, we're looking at their EEG, and if we identify the spike wave index, then we can provide medication. Um, with some of the kids, if they have epilepsy that's well controlled, um, we also have things like diet therapy. So our clinic, um, because we're a comprehensive center, we do offer um, the ketogenic and modified Atkins diet. So 
for some of my kids, I'm able to put them on the diet because I coordinate that clinic as well. And we've seen great improvements with that as well. So diet therapy, medications, um, you know, things that we can do to help. Right, great. Um, Christine, can, can you give a few examples of epilepsy-related factors that have affected your son's school performance and specific medical interventions that have helped? Absolutely. Um, like she said, with my two twins, it's kind of crazy because one of them, Zachary, who is, you know, who we thought was two years seizure free, who we just found out is not, but there was no seizures. There's no grand moles. There's no absentee. There's no outward showing of seizures. So now we're on this end of the spectrum where we have Cameron with ESES and with, you know, 11 different types of seizures and all of the whole list just keeps going on and on and on. So for us, it was kind of a mix of trying to see both ends. Um, the school did really good for us with, you know, like with Cameron and the medical side of everything until he had his first major seizure with them, you know, and then 30 minutes later, he's still drooling and he haven't called an ambulance yet. You know, so that's where we had to bring in Cindy. You know, no, Cindy, I need you now. The school needs help. You know, that's been one of our, my saving graces right there is come teach the school what to do you know, for like, with the seizures, and that saved a lot. And since then, we haven't had any, you know, more issues. Um, I see now I lost myself. <laughs> so just any, any kind of, like, medical oh. interventions, like s switching a medication or changing the dosage, yeah, just and there's changing a lot. the timing of the dosage or that sort you of know, thing? You know, like, even the doctor's appointments and hospital visits, um, we found that, you know, my kids go to U of M, we found they have a school teacher there. So when they're in for an extended stay, and I'm sure that goes through with a lot of the hospitals, they're in for an extended stay. You know, his longest stay was 13 days. I had that school teacher in there every day. I signed consent that they could talk to the school. And so the school would send in the homework or the paper and whatever. The school, uh, the, the teacher at the hospital would come in and do what she could do with him. So then that way he wasn't too far behind. He was still getting lessons, even though he was in the hospital. Last year alone, Cameron missed 280 hours of school. So that it was quite a few days. It's a lot of days to try and catch up to. Um, so we have done, you know, modified grading. We've done, you know, extended periods of time. So it may be due on Friday for everybody else, but Cameron's going to get an extra two weeks so we can work on the weekends little by little to try and get it all in so he's not so over, you know, over anxious, over exerted, um, you know, there's there's several things that, you know, if he's home after seizure, after seizure, after seizure, you know, I'm very lucky we came from a smaller school now that they would actually send a teacher to my house to help with, you know, with the education so that way he doesn't fall too far behind. Just, uh, just to yeah. add one more thing, I think as parents, um, you know, we're all one team. So whatever neurologist or epileptologist that you're working with, you know, you're, you're the ones that know your children the best. So you interface with the school because that's where they spend the majority of their time. So when you're coming to clinic with us, just to, to add on to what she's saying, with, with interventions and things, you know, talk to your teachers. If they're spacing out, if they're seeming really tired, sometimes in clinic we'll start switching even how we're giving the medication. I might give a little less during the day if I find that they're super sleepy or tired, or I might need to add an afternoon dose of a medication if they're having issues with the seizure. So finding out like when they're having more of their difficulties, if, if, the, if the school is able to figure that out. Because the teacher's role is so important at the school, but they need the education. Because if they have no idea um, what your child's seizures are like or how they can best help, um, you know, I think it's, it's really important because then we can make modifications on our end with changing meds or, you know, giving meds. Sometimes the medications we use, it's the combination. And, you know, we might think this is the best, you know, medication uh, combination for your child. And then they're like, they're doing terrible in school. You need to do something. So it's really important that, you know, you bring that to us so that we can interface and we can talk to the teachers and to the school. So. Right. Okay. So um, probably the most common cognitive uh, problems experienced by children with epilepsy relate to attention, executive function, processing speed, and memory. Um, so in order to develop appropriate educational supports and strategies, you first have to understand the nature of 
the child's cognitive difficulties. And that can be done through an assessment by a school psychologist or an assessment with a neuropsychologist. Um, so Haley, can you talk uh, about the differences between these two types of assessments and the circumstances under which each would be used and, and, and kind of the steps that need to be taken to obtain an assessment? Sure. So I will say it's almost a little bit like a Venn diagram. So there's a little bit of overlap between what we do. We use similar tools within a school assessment, which you would call a psychoeducational assessment or a neuropsychological evaluation. Uh, but the goals are a little different. So part of the school assessment is to really understand your child and their learning goals and what kind of school accommodations or modifications to the curriculum are needed to help them attain their um, highest education. So really they'll do an extensive academic workup, intelligence testing, uh, observations within the classroom to see how your child is interacting within the classroom. And so it's something that you would want to request if you suspect there's maybe a specific learning disability, so problems with learning, um, reading, writing, math, maybe if there's some interferences with behavior or emotions in the classroom, problems turning in homework, maybe sleeping, um, or just other adaptive functioning. And um, that's something that you would request through a formal letter to the school system. And so really the goal is to help understand what they, we can do with the school curriculum. A neuropsychological evaluation, the goal is to understand those underlying cognitive processes and relate those to their medical condition. So really it's understanding your child and understanding um, their needs so that the medical team, we can help the medical team make medical decisions. So for example, you would want to request this if you see problems, um, changes in their cognitive functioning, so their memory, learning, um, attention, um, especially if they're in consideration for epilepsy surgery, usually neuropsychologists are closely involved to help monitor um, possible side effects of the surgery, um, help determine you know, what parts of the brain are doing okay and might be, effect and might be affected if you do surgery. Um, if there's cognitive side effects of medication, that's another thing that neuropsychologists can help you understand. And if maybe the academic interventions have failed, so you've done a school evaluation, they've given you the accommodations that they think your child needs to succeed, and there's still some struggle in school, a neuropsychologist can understand those underlying cognitive processes. Um, and so in a medical setting with a neuropsychologist to request that, you typically need a referral from your neurologist to um, have insurance help cover it, and you need to determine that there's a medical need, so epilepsy, but you don't want to say, oh, they're having trouble learning or reading or math or anything like that. You want to, it's about their cognitive processes, and that's how you can get insurance to help cover it. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it, we, we talked about some of the medical interventions um, that can help address some of these cognitive and, and school performance issues. But um, some, again, some of these things are not reversible, so you, you, you need to kind of really focus on the day-to-day -day strategies that you're going to use to com compensate for some of these deficits. Um, so let's start by talking about memory. This is probably the most co common cognitive complaint among people with epilepsy. So Anne-Marie and, and Haley, can you describe the most common types of memory problems experienced among children with epilepsy? So what we see from a medical perspective is um, a lot with like their short-term memory. Um, they know the information, they just, they just can't pull it out when, it, when it's needed. And um, I think that, you know, that becomes an issue with like with their processing speeds and then they get anxious because you know, it's, it's supposed to be, you know, you're supposed to be sometimes put on the spot to answer a question and they know it, they just can't do it. So we see a lot um, of just not being able to, not being able to pull that information out from, from our perspective. Mm -hmm. And typically a neuropsychologist can help untangle what aspect of the process is um, your child might be having a trouble, trouble with. So usually a neuropsychologist will ask you to like, what are your observations? What do you see with memory? So some parents might say, I gave my kid four things to do and they only did one of them, okay? 
Or they might say, we went over to a friend's house over the weekend and they have no memory that we were there. Um, or we studied all night, they knew all of this material, and then the next day they didn't do well on the test, they didn't understand it, but they had it before. Or um, a common thing is, I'm, I'm looking for the word that I'm trying to say, right? It's there, it's the tip of the tongue, maybe they just have struggled figuring out what that word is. And so there's different parts of the memory process that could be affected. So like we talked about, maybe it's the attention, or is the information getting in? Is that the problem that your child is experiencing? Um, or is it a problem with storage, so where in the hippocampus or where your brain is storing the memory, is there some problem? Or is there just a problem, it's there, but they have trouble accessing it? So is it a language issue? Um, is it something else that you can't get that material? Maybe an organization, how you're organizing it in your memory. And so a neuropsychologist has lots of different tests. They can kind of figure out which part of the process uh, might be struggling. Um, and we talked about the epilepsy factor, so there's a lot of factors that could affect uh, memory. So that includes where the seizure is, the medications that you're taking, um, maybe there's something affecting the processing, their language processing, or the way it's solidified, like we talked about with the sleep, the CSWS. Um, and Carrie Jo, as an educational therapist, what are some of the day-to-day -day, day -day strategies and, and technologies that you find most helpful for students with memory challenges? Okay, so Haley, thank you, because when I read this question, I was like, oh my gosh, that's like a whole workshop in itself. <laughs> because it really, so the students I work with, almost all of them have a neuropsych report, and that neuropsychologist is doing exactly what Haley said, so I know what type of memory issue I'm working with, because it does, it really varies on what, I'm not gonna repeat it, because she said it so perfectly, right? Like, the memory supports you need really depend and are specific on what the memory issue is, but there's basic memory supports that I make sure every student that I work with has in place, one of them is taking notes, which I do because I tell every single student, I'm gonna take notes during our session because I'm not gonna remember next week what we worked on because I have 12 students and I'm not gonna remember whether or not you're taking chemistry or biology, right? So when I come, when you come back and see me next week and I'm like, how was your biology test? And you're like, I had a chemistry quiz, right? Like I take notes. So I'm showing and telling my students that's what I did and that's what I did for today. Mm -hmm. but. I make sure every single one of my students, and it's so important, that they have a planner or a calendar, an agenda, whatever you want to call it. It can be an old-fashioned paper planner, or it can be online on your phone or on your computer, but they need a planner to plan out homework and activities and family things. Um, just, you need one of those. Um, it's <coughs> also, technology is great, so there's so many different apps. Um, for talk to text. So if you have to send yourself a quick reminder, you can talk it into your phone now, right? So that's great. Um, I also find with a lot of students um, with difficulties with memory, writing is also hard because when you have a thought in your head, sometimes by the time you get it to the paper and write it out, it's gone. So talk to text is also great for that. Talking into your phone, um, again, there's so many different apps. Um, for that. Um, other great memory supports, visual aids and posters, write down what you need to do. Break things down into steps. If it's the issue of, I told them to do four things and they only did one and then they were playing video games. Well, write it down, break it down. Um, then they can go back and see it. Um, graphic organizers for writing. So before you tackle that 10 page essay, like jot down some bullet points and some headings. Know what every page and paragraph is gonna be about. Um, using timers um, to break up periods of work so you know, okay, if I can try to focus for 15 minutes, then you take a 10 minute break. So kind of learning where your student's at and how long they can work before they need a break so they're not overtaxed. Um, and also, in a, being a parent of a child who has these issues, just knowing that you need to give them rem reminders. Um, so a couple specific things I did kind of jot down. Um, so if they have difficulty independently starting a task, which I think is common, um, break it into steps and make a plan. Again, have visual aids, and then just monitor with check-ins. Um, 
If they're forgetting or losing belongings, which is so common with every single student that I work with, um, and when they tell me it's not an issue, I'm like, I'm gonna double check with your parents when you leave on that. Um, I find a lot, it's creating routines so that they know when they come home from school, the backpack goes on the hook by the door. So when they need the backpack, it's on the hook by the door. It's just all about creating and following routines so that it takes out the guesswork. Um, um, and then difficult, I think I talked about this, um, remembering what they were told to do, write it down, break it into steps, and have them repeat it back to you. Um, and so I love Google. Um, and for working memory, there's a great page. Um, it's called LD at School. And if you just Google that in working memory, it comes up with, there's, ton, there's pages of them. The struggle you're seeing with your child in specific supports, which is great to implement at home or even take to a teacher at school. Great, a lot of great ideas. Uh, so in the interest of time, let's talk about attention and executive function together because they're closely related. So Haley, can you give an overview of the nature of attention and executive function disorders and describe some of the specific cognitive functions that fall under the category of executive function? Sure, so when we think of executive functioning, it's really these higher order cognitive processes that we use for goal-directed behavior, but really just means our ability to plan, and problem solve. That's usually what people think of with executive functioning. Um, but there's also a lot of different components to that. So that includes um, working memory, attention, behavior regulation or impulse control, putting on the brakes to things, being able to, having some cognitive flexibility, switching between tasks, um, and information processing. And so typically when we think of this executive functioning, you think of the prefrontal cortex, which is one of the last areas of the brain to develop. Um, so it's actually not fully develop, developed until you're in your 20s. Um, and, but there's also connections with other parts of the brain as well. That's a big part of executive functioning. It's like a conductor getting everything to work together. Um, but it's a developing process, like I said. It doesn't, it's not fully formed until you're in your 20s. But it's also a behavior that's learned, so we know that there's strategies and ways that you can learn, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about those strategies. Um, it's like reading, it's a skill that you can develop over time. Okay, great. And Carrie Jo, can you talk about some common problems with school performance that result from executive function and attention disorders, and then some of the strategies that you found to be most helpful in minimizing those negative consequences? Oh, your section. mic. Oh. <laughs> okay, so I was saying, I think I forgot to take notes on this section. <laughs> um, but a lot of it is what I was just saying before. Um, it's creating routines. So it's very <coughs> common where the students do their homework and forget to turn it in, which is so frustrating because you've worked so hard on that. But a lot of this is creating a routine, and this is where... I love to be part of the team with the teacher, so I agree with Anne-Marie. It's a whole team effort, because if they're working on this, getting it, getting that paper to the classroom and forgetting to turn it in, it's just a routine. So with one student we had where he, we ha you had to go out and buy the binders with the clear cover, so he would do his homework the night before, put it in the clear covered binder, and then it was a communication with the teacher that she knew if he didn't turn it in, because that homework basket was not working, she would get it out of the clear binder. So it's really individual, but again, it's a routine that works for every student, and that's something you really have to work out with the teacher, because they all have a different system. Um, but I, yeah, that's really common. Procrastinating, again, that's where that calendar and the online planner come in so handy, because when, and this again, you have to be in communication with the teacher, because if you're not, you're not gonna know that they just got an essay due in three weeks. But when you know about that, you need to sit down with the calendar and say, okay, it's due here, we're gonna be done two days before the due date, and then break it down a paragraph or a page at a time. So it's all about breaking everything into steps. Right. Okay, and um, <clears throat> Christine, have you, either of your boys struggled with uh, attention or executive function? And, and if so, 
what accommodations or supports um, in school and what strategies at home have been most helpful for you? I think everyone in this room is like, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, it, it, it is, it's very common, it, and it drives me nuts. We've done the color-coded folders. We've done the binder with seven little, you know, folders <laughs> inside. We've done the, the backpack with the ever-ending papers in the bottom that just keep getting more and more and more. We, we, we've done all of that, and sometimes it just... <laughs> you know, sometimes it, it, it just feels so frustrating and endless. It's like, come on, there's got to be something. One thing we've learned last year is we did a check-in and check-out. So he checks in with his resource teacher every morning before school, he gets a piece of paper with all of his teacher's names, the hour that he's in there, you know, and it's got like five boxes. Did you talk appropriately? Did you handle social, you know, interactions appropriately? Did you do your homework? And then we got a big old box that says, what homework do you have to do tonight? Um, so then before he goes every class, first thing he does is goes right up to his teacher. And we had to obviously communicate with every single teacher this is what's going to happen you know before class he walks right up to her she fills out everything at the end of class he goes up to her she fills out the homework and if he is appropriately behaved in class or if he's made the right choices and they give him a score at the he's 15 he's going to be 16 in a month but yet we still do you know reward systems also you know now instead of candy and a candy bar now it's a twenty dollar gift card for you know Xbox or you know whatever it may be the you know the rewards change but you know we finally found it you know okay I got this homework you know and she knows if he's not walking up with that homework where's your homework you know so then that kind of gives that cue to remind them go get my homework it's in my you know it's right here in my folder so that's one thing we have found that has shown some improvement you know we're not missing 40 different homework assignments because they're in the bottom of that book bag, right? You know, and that's one of the biggest things that we have found that have worked with my boys. Right, right. And I, my, my daughter has ADHD, and, and I, one of the things that happens is that her, she will be finishing a task or, or needs to finish a task, but her mind has moved on to the next one. And there's, if, if she's interested in that next thing, there's no way that ta that task that she's currently doing is going to get finished. Is there any strategy for, I guess, getting people to um, complete tasks? Um, I think the strategy you talked about earlier with the timing, like working for chunks of time can be really effective. Yeah. So I'm going to work for 20 minutes have my focus and then I can do whatever entertaining thing it is and having a timer so that that break time doesn't go too long. Right. And with students who do that where they finish and then they're hyper focused on something else, I'll say, okay, set the timer, do that for five minutes, but you have to go back. It's just life. <laughs> right, right. Okay, great. Um, so, um, Anne-Marie and Haley, can you briefly review some of the other cognitive difficulties that can go along with epilepsy that we haven't yet discussed? So, I, I think one of the things that we also have to think about is like anxiety. So, anxiety, so when you think about um, epilepsy, epilepsy is quite a spectrum. But on the spectrum can also be learning issues, cognitive issues, attention issues, and anxiety and depression issues. So I think with anxiety, um, I think is really important to be thinking about because um, they may, you know, ki kids might get nervous over things, they might get overwhelmed very easily um, with certain packets. Um, I just, I, do I have any, are there any other, there's educators in the room? So as an educator, you know, I think it's important that, again, as a parent and an educator, that we, we develop these relationships and these roles. So, you know, as the kids are younger, like in elementary and middle school, you know, as the parent, we're speaking with the boys. But some of our kids in high school that we want to have them be independent, they, they still need some prompts and some reminders. So I think developing that essential role with the teachers, because if they have in high school or in middle school, they have 
um, all this homework, or the procrastinators like Haley mentioned, um, which we all can be at times if we really don't want to do a certain task. But um, you know, I think you have to look at you have to look at developing those relationships with the educator, talking to them, um, because if they're really anxious, they're going to shut down. They're not going to do it. The anxiety can look like an attention problem. So you might be thinking you're dealing with someone who has an attention deficit issue, but it really clearly could be just an anxiety issue. And you have to tease it out. Having the school um, psychologist, the school social worker, the school counselor, a neuropsychologist, um, you know, those are things that we look at because that, as well as learning difficulties. We didn't talk about learning difficulties. How your child learns may not be how this child learns. So, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, is your child more of an auditory learner? Do they do better with just the written materials? You know, finding out how your child learns the best and then working with the educators and with the supports to help capitalize on that. Because I think that that's really important from that respect. Yeah, and I think um, because epilepsy can affect any part of the brain, really any of the cognitive uh, functions could be affected. So language functioning is probably the most noticeable by people, by parents. Um, maybe it's problems uh, with the organization of their speech, understanding things, or the word finding things like we've talked about. There could be visual spatial deficits, which is harder to see. Um, motor skills and, like you said, learning disabilities occur in about 25% of kids with epilepsy compared to 1 to 2% in the general population. Um, and I think the important thing to note, though, is that some cognitive, cognitive changes are more permanent. So it's because maybe this part of the brain was affected or um, there was surgery there or something like that. But there's also some temporary or treatable cognitive changes, and that's the really important thing where you talk to your medical doctor or a neuropsychologist can help you figure out. So those things could be medication side effects, the seizures themselves, if they're having the inner ictal discharges or the things happening during sleep, those are all cognitive changes that we can have an intervention for and help prevent. Um, and certain seizure types are associated with certain cognitive processes because they affect that part of the brain. So temporal lobe epilepsy is typically, you think of memory problems because of it's where it's located, it affects the memory center of the brain, but each child is different, and so it's, it's just kind of in general, we can't really make those sorts of predictions. Right, okay, so um, we've talked about neuropsychologists and, and obviously nurse practitioners and epileptologists, but Carrie Jo, can you, can you describe some of the different types of professionals that parents can enlist to help with cognitive and academic challenges both in and out of school? So I always like to think of it as a team effort, so I love that I'm hearing that throughout the room and across the panel. Um, so I always start within the school, right? The teachers, the paraprofessionals. The, as a former teacher, the paraprofessionals are so important. I always felt like they were doing all the work. Um, in school, occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech, and the social worker. And it's kind of the same team outside of school. You can also do all of that privately. Educational therapists, and also if you need, private subject tutors. Okay, great. Um, so we've talked about um, some specific cognitive problems and then specific strategies for dealing with those problems, but can you talk some about some more, some of the more general behaviors that can help with overall cognitive function and school performance? And anyone can jump in with any thoughts on that. I think I agree with the sleep being number one. That's so important. And I think especially as students get older, I see with my high schoolers where they're like, well, I go to bed at 10, but I'm on my phone till midnight. And I'm like, that doesn't count as going to bed at 10 if you're on your phone. So I, sleep is so important. Especially when they say, well, I use it as my alarm. I hear that all the time. My phone is my alarm. You know, so, you know, we sleep hygiene, I think we spend the most in clinic talking about sleep hygiene and talking about getting to sleep and not having the computer in the room, not having the phone in the room. If you have to have the phone in the room, it should be across the hall with it upside down because parts of your brain still hear that buzz or still hear that, see that blue light even though they're sleeping and wake up. So, you know, I think it's, we have to look at the whole total child, you know, sleep and diet and all of those things make such a difference for, for your child's health. 
Okay, other thoughts? Christina, have you noticed any particular general lifestyle or health behaviors that have had a positive impact on your boys? I think a lot of it's what they said, you know, yeah. the sleep, the eating, the, you know, we've got a rule with video games, you know, you need to be off home within two hours before bedtime because mm -hmm. that just keeps their mind going and mine are gamers. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what that is. <laughs> That's what they say they are. <laughs> Um, you know, and it, it, it's knowing the child, you know, you're the, my parents, you're going to see what kind of day you're going to have. I know before they go to bed, most some nights, okay, this is going to be a long night. Look at him, he's lethargic, he's already, you know, not feeling good, and you're just going to know, you know. So some mornings I'll call the school and say, hey, we've had a long night, he's sleeping an extra hour, and then we'll be there. You know, that's probably why he had over 250 hours missing, but you know, he's got to need it otherwise he's not going to be any good in school the next day you know that extra hour could make a huge difference for those kids um, you know just just knowing them you know mom I'm just not feeling good you know Cameron was really big on oh I threw up I got to go home you know and then it was trying to figure out knowing okay did you really throw up or you just want to come home you know and sometimes they'll do that for that attention or for that well, I don't want to be here. I've got a big test today, you know. Um, so sometimes we have to figure out what, you know, what they need. But I just went way off topic. topic. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, I think that's really close. And I, I was going to also add other factors. You talked a little bit about anxiety. That can be a factor. Social drama, their effort, attention, just all of these different factors could affect them wanting to go to school. And that affects their school performance more than the tests that we give them. And I think too, just adding on, talk to your so like if your if your child, you know, they had a bad night, they had a seizure, they had a really bad migraine and a seizure. You know, having a plan in place with the school, I think, is really important. Like, um, I've done many letters for many of my patients that you know maybe they can't make it to the first class. Um, or the first hour, so having a plan in place with the teacher so that, okay, if they're not there for the first hour, maybe that's their their study class or, or something so that they can get to class. Or, or maybe there could be something like with um, computer generated that they could do the first class at home once they wake up. But having that support with them so that the, the yep, we're just calling in again. No, it's medically they can't get there kind of a thing. So. Right, and, and I, I just want to emphasize exercise as well, which I think you know some parents might be concerned that an, that exercise might trigger a seizure, and, and in a very small minority of, of uh, people with epilepsy, it can. But for the most part, moderate exercise is not going to trigger a seizure. In fact, it's going to improve your sleep. It's going to improve your cognitive function. It's going to improve your mood, reduce anxiety. So there's so many benefits to exercise as well that um, can often get overlooked. So, um, all right, um, I think now is a good time actually uh, to, to open it up for, for questions. So thank you all for, for your, your uh, input and uh, let's use the, the next 15 minutes or so for questions. I just wanted to follow up with your exercise thing. I was thinking about sharing. Um, we found with our daughter and son, uh, who just suffers from migraines, that we have a routine in the morning you know 16 to 20 ounces of water as soon as you wake up she's crabby I say drink your water she comes around and after school same thing 16 20 ounces of water and in the evening and when she goes to be in a camp with her pills it's necessity you drink a bottle of water with your medicine because she gets distracted she won't focus won't hydrate throughout the day and it seems to have helped yeah I think just all healthy behaviors are going to have a positive impact on seizure control, possibly, and almost definitely on school performance. Uh, to tie in with the uh, activity, um, our son is a big runner, very active, but our daughter does not want to do anything. <laughs> so we found that she loves animals. So we did the Howell Nature Center uh, 5K, but as, as a walk, and she wanted to help animals, so she's walking and training to help animals. So she's helping herself, but... <laughs> It tricked her into keep doing something. <laughs> so, way around. That's a great idea. Yeah. Other questions? Sort of a little off topic, but can you guys touch on how 
the reflexes that we're all born with ties into epilepsy. I know my son has retained his moral reflex and his tonic labyrinth reflex, which have, they said, like, instead of suppressing them when you're, what, two to four months of age, he has retained them. And so that's, that's also affecting his schoolwork. That's also affecting his behavior. That's also affecting his focusing. So can you guys tie that in together? How is that affecting the, how, how is the epilepsy affecting the, the reflexes that we're supposed to suppress when we're infants? So those are called atavistic reflexes. So things like, um, like the snout reflex or the bulldog reflex or the biting reflex or a moro, which is like a startle now as they get older. So like some kids, if they hear a loud noise, they'll startle and they'll have a seizure. So that has a lot to do with um, like if there's any other brain malformation, sometimes those, those never get, those atavistic or reflexes that should disappear as they get older and their milestones disappear. So it has a lot to do with brain development. It has a lot to do with, with when they start having their seizures and how well controlled they are. So, you know, working with like, um, when, when those reflexes do persist, working with like your therapist, like your physical and your occupational therapist, working with like physical medicine and rehab, other ways to um, help them overcome them. I mean, because unfortunately, if those atavistic or those primitive reflexes don't disappear, um, then it's how can you, uh, um, as a parent, and how can we as professionals and um, help to help them like be able to, to work with those throughout their life. Is that yeah. Can you touch more on like behavior issues? Like very, he gets, our son he, uh, was just diagnosed, he's 17 years old. And now that we look back on it, his anger was very severe, running up, coming up to when he first had seizures. And um, it, the medication he was on, the first one did not work at all. It, it made it so much worse. But he still has anger problems, even though the medication he's on now is supposed to help it, but it, it's not. He still has just severe anger issues. And how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with that with the school too and making sure they are aware of it and that kind of thing? I just want, you're not alone. Okay. I, um, I know how difficult this conversation can be. My son at 10 years old was thrown in the back of a police car because of behaviors. So I absolutely understand. I want to make sure you know you're not alone. Okay. Yeah, and I think with the not being alone, there's a lot of supports that you can get as well. So I would definitely recommend um, consulting with a psychologist who can help you figure out you're with your child the most, strategies that you can do to help feel get empowered so that you can help support uh, your child as much as possible. Um, there's lots of different strategies that you can use and then also therapy for him to kind of under understand what kind of is the source of those anger problems and kind of having someone evaluate that and, and really get to know your child. Is there, there's not a lot of research that really brings the two together. With epilepsy and behavior, yeah, there, it's another comorbid condition. There's a lot of issues with behavior. There's a lot of literature and research that's out there that behavior issues can occur. It's not just attention or school issues or anxiety issues. There is there is a lot of evidence out there about some children do have behavioral issues related to it. So, and also, <coughs> not only with what the wonderful suggestions our panelists said, but also involving, so if you're developing strategies with like a therapist or such, those also have to be carried out in the school too. Because it can't, you know, they're in school the majority of the day. So, you know, if the therapists are recommending certain, um, certain techniques or things like that, that has to be carried over in school so that everybody is following the same routine, the same path for him. Yeah, I would imagine it's, it's some level of of teaching the student uh, strategies to calm themselves down and to, to um, be able to lessen that anger, but also um, teaching those around them strategies for <coughs> de-escalating and for um, helping to calm the student down too, so. And I think some, and certainly not knowing your child, I think sometimes anger and sometimes behavioral issues, the panel agrees, is they think they're, they're the only ones. I'm the only one in the school 
and my, I'm the only one in my, of my age or of my friends that doesn't drive. I'm the only one of my age or my friends that can't do this or that. And, you know, spending the time talking about, you know, no, you're not, you know, you may not be able to drive. No, you may not be able to do this or that. But then figuring out other positive ways, you know, A, to get that, first that's got to get out, and we've got to deal with that first, but then substituting it with other things. I think for my twins, too, Camp Discovery through the Epilepsy Foundation and North Star Reach has been huge because they're there with all kids. All the kids there have epilepsy. All of them there. They're not, you know, oh, you had a seizure. Yeah, okay, well, I'll have one in five minutes. You know, like, they, they get it, you know. <laughs> you can't be around anybody else that gets it any more than, you know, these kids. And they have a blast. Oh, do they have a blast. This is my kid's seventh year going. And they beg to go every every year. Mom, did you sign this up yet? Mom, is it time? No, guys, January. Mom, it's January. Yes, guys, I've already done it. You know, they, they a huge advocate for Camp Discovery. What is that? It's camp, like, camp Camp Discovery is our summer camp for for kids with epilepsy. It's for ages seven through fifteen, and then we also have Solstice Camp, which is for ages sixteen and seventeen. And that camp also includes. Um, uh, other children with other chronic health conditions. It's truly amazing. You know, and like I said, seven years of just true amazing friendships. You know, that's where I've met a lot of my epilepsy moms that I hold near and dear to my heart that, you know, you don't realize, oh, I'm alone in this. Oh, no, I'm not. I've got all these other moms that I'm with now that we still talk to, every, you know, not every day, but, you know, throughout the year because of Camp Discovery. And is it possible to employ some of the older epileptic uh, or students with epilepsy in these camps? I mean, if they're past 17, or that might be like a win-win. Yeah. That's yeah. Several, several, several of our camp counselors were former campers, and and they, absolutely they serve as mentors for the younger kids. We have some some adults who are in their. 30s or 40s too, who didn't attend camp, but they have epilepsy themselves, and and the kids look up and say, "Hey, so you're 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 working, you're doing this, you're doing, and and so that's a just real positive role model." So, I think the last point I want to make content of that too is, you know, the kids have to realize, and and that's up to all of us as professionals, but as parents, you know, we want our kids, and I say my kids because um, we want our kids to feel like they're like everybody else. They're as normal as possible. No, they may not be able to do this or this, but treating them as normal as possible, encouraging them, and I know I'm preaching to the choir too, um, treating them as normal as possible, putting them in situations that you know they can do. It might be uncomfortable for them, but at the end, they may come back and say to you, trust me, at one point, I'm still waiting for my son who's 22 to say, Thanks, Mom, for letting me do that. <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah, exactly. but, you know, just know your kids. You want them, like every other family, it doesn't matter if you have a chronic condition like epilepsy or diabetes or a heart condition, you want your child to be the best they can be. And that's what all of us and what all of the people on your team should be doing. I tell my kids all the time, every day, you can do anything you want to do. It's just sometimes we may have to take a few extra precautions. Don't mean you can't do it. We just got to be a little bit more careful sometimes. So if you're climbing that tree, you better hope someone's with you to make sure you don't, you know, fall out or, you know, Cameron got mad at me because I wouldn't let him go to the beach by himself. You, I don't care if you bring your 12-year-old brother, you just have to have somebody with you. You know, it, you can still go, you just got to have a buddy, so you got to have some, some precautions. Okay, other questions? A few minutes left. All right, I get, we will transition to our next session. So thank you all for a, a 